Hello everyone. Welcome to today's session on ML and data engineering. We will discuss about the evolution of uh, the data engineering and ML and AI, how how that happened over the course of last one decade. And to discuss that, uh, we have uh, Dan Sullivan, uh, who is uh, the author of multiple um, Google's official books, as well as data architect and author and instructor, as well as speaker. Um, uh, Dan's uh, been number one uh, Udemy instructor for a lot of courses. So welcome, Dan, uh, to our uh, show today. Thank you. It's, I'm really excited to be here. I'm looking forward to this. I think it's a great topic. I appreciate the chance to talk about this with you all. Glad to have you here, Dan. Excellent. And yes, we have Ranga as well, who is like Dan, uh, one of Udemy's top instructor, and we all know who is Ranga. Welcome, Ranga. Thank you, Amit. <laughs> Sure. So with that, let's get started. Um, Dan, I uh, want to hear from you. Uh, you've been in this uh, industry, in this data world for quite a long time. So how does this uh, ML and data engineering world have evolved over the last uh, seven, eight, ten years, right? So previously, mm -hmm. if you say data, people work in data, it's like big, big data warehouses, on-premise, very yeah. heavy uh, processing. So now with the invent of data lakes and similar other technologies, so, so where do you see like for what we were 10 years before and what we are now, if you can give us like a snapshot. Yeah, boy, it's, it's really, it's, it, I, I think I sometimes forget how much has changed. Like 10 years ago, it's like you said, it's like a lot of stuff we were doing, stuff on-prem. I mean, things like S3 and, you know, um, cloud storage. I mean, there was we were starting to work in cloud, but it really, nothing like it is now. So, um, and certainly things like data warehousing was like on-prem. You'd have large, you know, for servers or maybe have a cluster of servers and you were running, you know, maybe Oracle rack if you were, you know, not so lucky because it was, and it was really painful. I mean, it was painful to like get Oracle working, especially like Oracle, like clusters um, when you're trying to scale up for large uh, data warehouses. Um, the data ingestion was painful. We didn't have great ETL tools like we have now. Um, and storage was always an issue. It's like, you know, even 10 years ago, you were run, worried about running out of disk space. And, and like, we don't have to think about that anymore. Like we can just put everything, you know, into cloud storage, even if we don't need to load it, you know, into BigQuery or if we're using like Postgres for something smaller, you know, we can still have access to the data when we need it. The tools are much better. I mean, we didn't, never had anything like Dataflow 10 years ago. Um, and so, so the tools are much better. We, we don't have to think as much about infrastructure because now it's all, you know, so much of uh, the infrastructure that we need is virtualized and we can have access to it in pretty short order. So I think, you know, one of the things that has shifted is there's less like messing around with the plumbing, the hardware, the software that like make, that, that you build the stack on and, and it's much easier to deploy. So even with like things like containers, I mean, we can you like replicate a deployment. It's like, if you remember the days where you install software on your own server and like, you know, your friend would get it up and running because he had a different library installed and you know, you have something different. And so you hit a problem. And so, you know, you're on news groups or whatever, trying to figure out how to debug something. And that kind of thing doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, I mean, well, that's not true. I mean, Stack Overflow is filled with questions, but but there are different kinds of problems that we run into. So um, yeah, so it's more like how do you use the software? It's interesting when I'm you know when I see stuff like looking at questions on Stack Overflow. It's more like how do you do this in BigQuery? It's not how do you like change the configuration of the software I want to install. So I think a lot of the barriers to entry for software engineering and data engineering and data science are now sort of, they're lower, they're much lower now, um, both in terms of being having access to the software that's properly configured, and then just having access to the resources, like the, the hardware resources. I mean, the idea of being able to run some of the models that are run now, like the, some of the, the natural language processing models that are billions of, of parameters, and it's just like, you know, doing that years ago was just unthinkable, um, even if you could get the, the um, you know, the software all set up. I mean, you just didn't have the hardware to do that, but now you can just keep allocating larger and larger clusters and, or use TPUs. Like we never had, 
TPUs. It was great when, you know, yeah. TPUs first started getting adopted and you had stuff like CUDA and you could use like Python libraries. And so that was really cool and that was exciting, but you're still kind of limited right, to whatever right. your, your box was, your server was. And now it's just, it's so strange where you can just spin up, you know, a Jupyter notebook in the cloud and it's essentially serverless. Um, you have access to TPUs. If you have enough money, you have EP access to TPU clusters and you can build these really big models. So it's, uh, it's now it's like the, the distance from like having an idea in your head and actually be able to like test out a model and try it out and tweak it is much shorter. And like the time, time to actually get like just a, a, even a basic prototype is, is much shorter. So I think there's a lot more iterating I think, you know, there's there's mm -hmm. a lot more sharing of knowledge because in the past it used to be, you know, you'd write a paper or you, you know, share some notes and share some code. But it's it's much easier now. Everybody uses Git. Everybody understands how to use Git. So it's very easy to share code. It's not as unstandardized un un or destandardized as it um, used to be. So I think we we've, we've all come a long way in terms of like software engineering practices and adopting those in the data world as well. I mean, Agile started as like a really to address problems in software engineering, but you know, a lot of the things, a lot of the practices Agile created work really well in the data world as well. And like ML and the ML world is, as well. So we have like this idea of ML ops or data ops. It's all, you know, because it works so well in software engineering. So I think that also helps. I think there's, there's a confluence of a bunch of things going on here that, you know, the between the access to, to infrastructure in the cloud, access to, to software, and, and then, you know, having these sort of practices, these really good methodologies, you know, put them all together and, and it sort of got us to where we are today. Yes, absolutely. I, I had a bit of a giggle, like when you said, it's very strange, now you can just pin up uh, like imagine if somebody is starting that data engineering journey now and if you tell them 10 years ago we were doing something like this and that's exactly what they would say that's very strange how can you do like that? <laughs> <laughs> right yeah i mean the idea of having to think about you know what is your process do you have a pentium processor in your desktop machine and what can you do with it and like we just don't think about that anymore if we need to change like our vm it's a pretty simple order to go from you know four virtual CPUs to 24 if we needed it. Um, yeah, and, the, and then before that would, you would just think, oh, well, I'll, I'll have to wait till next year when I get another budget and I can buy another server. And so, yeah, so a lot of that, that stuff, that, that uh, you know, kind of artificial time delay or um, those, we just don't deal with those anymore. Yes, yeah. yes absolutely. So, yeah. um, so we, we have data lakes now. We had data warehouses on premises. Now everything is on cloud. Uh, what do you see as the next uh, kind of a data platform? Like BigQuery, obviously, is one where we can perform mm -hmm. a lot of our data uh, kind of analytics things. But what what do you see as the next future in terms of ML and data engineering? Well, I think yeah, data lakes I think are definitely here to stay because they're it's sort of it's almost like a practice. It's it's very unstructured or it's very loose. I mean, it's basically like you you have a lot of issues around um, like governance and compliance and and discovery. So you know, if you have this data lake, how are you going to make it make the data accessible in the sense of how do I search for what I'm looking for? So there are are sort of maturation or maturity problems that we have, like data lake's a great idea. And now that we're going to adopt them sign of en masse, it's like, okay, now we have to have practices to support them. And so I think one of the challenges and one of the things we'll see is development of tools around that. So things like Dataplex in Google, where Google, you know companies like Google are trying to build the, the tools that we need, the kind of the software infrastructure for managing these new platforms like Data Lake. And I know Databrick, uh, Databricks came up with this uh, idea. I think they coined the term Data Lake House, which is the idea of kind of taking some of the structure that we find in data warehouses and moving them to where the data is, like an object storage. And I think a big change and i'm not not sure if it's the biggest change but really significant change since like the the days when we would use like oracle and build data warehouses on prem is this idea that we can just keep the data in like a 
columnar storage file format like Avro or Parquet. And then there are these great tools like Presto or it's like Athena in AWS where you can use SQL to query the data. So the data can be in different places. It can be in an object storage system. We can have it loaded up into Spark. We can have it in a relational database or an analytical database like BigQuery. And it doesn't matter where you go. It's like a data scientist or an ML engineer. You can use SQL to get at the data. So that really opens up, I think, more possibilities. And I think we'll see, you know, SQLs will be the way of getting the data out at like a fine grain level. You know, we'll still need things like data flow for ETL kind of work and batch processing and, you know, bulk kind of operations. Um, but but SQL will allow, will allow people who maybe aren't as familiar with like ETL tools, but maybe get a big chunk of data out of the data lake, get it into BigQuery, and then they can start doing more fine grain work with SQL or start using uh, like the ML functions that are now built into BigQuery. So if you want to do some basic classification or do some linear regression, you can now do that with a SQL function. I mean, it's fantastic. It's like, that's the other thing. I think because SQL is so pervasive and it's well known and well understood, it becomes a target for adding new features that people want. So there's like mm -hmm. auto ML in, uh, in Google Cloud where, where you can you know, here, present, hey, here's my you know, tabular well-structured data, you know, build me a classification algorithm and you don't have to know about you know, boosting algorithms and you know, whether or not you wanna use uh, deep learning or any of that because the, you know, the service will figure that part out for you. And, and so you have your options. You know, if you're working in BigQuery, you can do it there. If you're working, if you have data somewhere else, you can use AutoML. Um, so I think, I think one of the, the things that are happening, it's, again, it's more of a, we've had these big changes in technology and now it's like we're, we're leveling, we're probably gonna level off a little bit because we have really good tools with like data lakes, data lake house, BigQuery, Snowflake, and we have tools like data flow for doing the big data movement. And now we're making things accessible with things like AutoML and ML in the data, like in BigQuery. And now we have to figure out like as organizations, businesses, how do we start making use of this? And I feel like it's like, um, you know, years ago, like like it was around like 2006 or, se or, or eight when people started figuring out how do you train really deep uh, neural nets and people figured that out. And then for like, you know, the next 15 years, we've been like building bigger and bigger models and we're still using backprop as like backpropagation in, is like the core in the algorithm. So it's like, we didn't have to have a rev another revolution just yet. It's like, we've got, we've made these really big advances and now we're going to kind of exploit those. Like how much can we squeeze out of like backpropagation? And, like, we get a lot. And now it's like, you know, and it's like, how much can we squeeze out of data lakes and data plex and the idea of, you know, managing the data? I think until we, like, we collectively mature and how we manage the data and deal with security issues and, and how we are going to be, like, building reliable, consistent, replicatable data processes. And we have the ideas, like, we have the methodologies, the tools are all there, but it's like, how mm. do how do you train, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are probably going to be needed exactly. data engineers to yeah. do this stuff? So, so I think um, the technology is always really cool. It's always fascinated me. I love working on this and I keep learning new stuff. Like even after like over 30 years doing this, it's still exciting. But it's like the really hard problem is like, how, how, do, how do you help other people? Get into, how do you help yourself exactly. learn? And yeah, like, you know, this, you, this is you do this day in and day out like wrestle with absolutely. this problem. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the major challenges that I saw when we talked about ML. Like mm -hmm. doing ML typically is so challenging and the learning curve is so steep. Uh, it's almost like, okay, you need to know programming. You need to be good at algorithms, data structures, and yeah. machine learning is a level on top of that again. I mean, it's not something like a framework that I can learn in a couple of months, right? It's something which you would learn uh, for a few years and even then probably and that's where I feel like I think the innovations that you're talking about right the cloud for example and like trying to make everything based out of SQL something that almost everybody understands and kind of simplifying it and putting things in the hands of developers so that 
they don't really focus on uh, like what's happening behind the screens because I mean developing a machine learning algorithm I mean like even though you probably even if you know what algorithm to use mm-hmm. like that itself is a big challenge and even you know that the uh, entire process of uh, doing ml is so challenging because oh, it's yeah. completely different from how you do programming right when i do a program i write a test i mm-hmm. know what logic i wrote and things like that but when it comes to ml it's completely based on data and yes. identifying yep. uh, like how like there are a lot of moving parts data can evolve and like the mod algorithms that you use evolves the process you use to develop evolves so it's all a complete black box kind of i mean yeah. it's all so complicated <laughs> it yeah it, yeah exactly it, it's so complicated and and it just keeps accelerating and it's like you know for i don't know maybe around 2010 2012 you know people started coming up with ways of dealing with like series oriented data like language or 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 you know anything where you you had like time series data and came up with like deep networks based on like um LSTMs and things like that and now it's like there's there's new methods with attention and it's just like you know and that and it's really enabled big things like the you know the very large um uh, language models but it's like you know you could you know just spend years studying like one of these algorithms and it's like it's so different and and it, clearly it builds on other stuff and so like if you understand deep net deep learning networks and and study you know the the algorithms then you can start building and you um can can keep up with what's going on but that's very focused like if you're doing that that's like taking all of your time and and the thing about machine learning is it's changes so much. I I had my first course in machine learning in like the mid 80s and I I think the only thing that's still around is like decision trees and evolutionary learning algorithms. Otherwise everything else like nobody does the the stuff that was taught back then. Um and then again it's like around 2006 that was a big inflection point with deep learning and now there's other stuff that's taking off building on that and and so unless you're really like in academia studying machine learning doing research on it i can't imagine how you could possibly keep up with the field and um you know and it's great that the the we all have access now i mean we have like archive and other resources on the internet where papers get published so anybody can go read this stuff um and uh but there's just the huge volume of it it's just it's just impossible to keep up uh yeah so it's it's yeah so so anybody who's out there who's learning and if it feels overwhelming you know you're not alone it's it's overwhelming for for a lot of us you know but don't get discouraged because it's super it's such a fascinating field it'll just it it can just keep you interested for decades and yeah right right so so what i understand is in the data engineering world no matter whatever you use what platform what you tool everybody is kind of converging into sql like trying to be able to write sql based queries so that is more powerful contrary to the cloud development world where the language is irrelevant you can code in python java go but yeah. the cloud platform allows you to run uh, programs in any languages right Yes. Yeah. So now, I mean, I think it, you, um, there's still plenty of, of need for things like Python or Go or Java for, you know, if nothing else, just automation. Um, but yeah, now you can kind of embed SQL into any of these and work with other sources. It, um, yeah, it's kind of um, it makes data accessible. So even if you're doing it interactively, like if you're a data scientist and doing ad hoc queries, you can write SQL. If you want to embed SQL into your microservice to pull in data like transactional data you can do that um you can use SQL for ETL operations so if you want to kind of transform your data you know you can definitely use tools and there's there's tools like DBT the database tool and open source tool that's becoming really popular as a as a transformation tool and it fits really well with like git ops and just you know related to like again going back to the software engineering it's like oh yeah you know it's like all these great methodologies from agile let's let's use them for etl and and other parts of uh data engineering so yeah i think yeah it's like you know we 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 collectively have kind of spotted like a handful of tools like spark is really good um very popular dataflow 
um, for like large scale data manipulation, BigQuery, Snowflake, or seem to be like really favored for like data warehouse like kind of things. Um, and really object storage, you know, Avro Parquet files, you know, that's what we use in the data lakes. And we still have to figure out some of the kind of governance, like the dataplex kind of thing, the metadata management and compliance um, and access control stuff. But um, now it does feel like from an analysis side, we're, we're kind of converging on a small set of tools, kind of like R and data science. It's like people either use R, if you have more of a statistical background, if you're more of a software engineering background, you probably tend toward Python. But it feels like the same kind of thing in data engineering. There's, there's probably 80% of the work is done by 20% of the tools that are available out there. We all, we all kind of use those. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, then just to touch upon uh, the evolution in terms of the data warehousing, right? So mm -hmm. like Terra data world uh, to maybe uh, like the AWS Redshift world to mm -hmm. today BigQuery, Synapse, Synapse Analytics, uh, probably Spark. Uh, do you want to touch upon the evolution of all these tools and how they are simplifying how you do data engineering today? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Redshift is an interesting one. And one of the things I love about Redshift is it's, it basically has like a Postgres interface. It feels like you're working with Postgres. And, um, you know, I just feel like, you know, it's like I worked with a lot of different databases, but hands out, like Postgres is just the best from a relational database perspective. Um, and so and we see that in other places, too. It's like um, Spanner now has a Postgres interface. So if you want to if you're working with Cloud Spanner and you are familiar with Postgres, then you have an easy way to work with it. And so I think a lot of the evolution, it, it tried to keep like the good stuff, like, oh, we're gonna build Redshift and it's gonna be like a columnar data store and we're gonna be able to do things in a more distributed way. Um, so Redshift kind of kept like Postgres and they didn't start from scratch. BigQuery feels like they really started from scratch. I mean, building on like Borg for running the jobs and the clusters. Um, and, and it wasn't even standard SQL. It's like uh, like the legacy SQL, whatever it was in the beginning. It was like, um, so sometimes, so Google didn't go down that path of like, like taking what already existed and building on it. They sort of started with a different approach. Um, and the concept of independently scaling storage yeah. and compute as well. <laughs> yeah. And that, I think, was the big thing for, for BigQuery, right? I think you're totally right about that. Is they, the first, they were the first I know of. I know Snowflake does that as well. They, they kind of you know, separate, decouple the compute from the storage. Um, but BigQuery was the first analytic platform that I came across that really did that. And um, I think BigQuery was really the... As, again, as far as I know, it's like the first big cloud database that really scaled well. And they had a, I mean, there were a number of things that that were in Google's favor and it had to do with their decision around the architecture. Um, yeah, separating the compute and the storage, I think was a big thing. The fact that they had Borg as a cluster manager that worked really well for, for the kind of workloads. And then another thing I think, I don't, you know, I'm not a networking person, but I think um, like the Jupyter network, the the fact that like if you have a rack in a Google Cloud data center and you've got the Jupyter network, you're getting the same kind of low latency going across racks that you do within a rack or within a server. And so the idea like when Spark first came out, I know we used to spend a lot of time thinking about rack awareness and do we want to do a shuffle across racks because it's so inefficient. And it's like in BigQuery, you don't have to think about that stuff because the network latency is so low. And so um, so I think, yeah, some of the, so some evolution is like incremental, like going with Redshift and we're going to build on what we have. And then other other kind of changes are more revolutionary. It's like with BigQuery, it's like, well, we're just going to start from scratch. And, you know, how would we want to build this if we were building something brand new? And, and um, yeah, just did, uh, they did a fantastic job. And, and, you know, yeah, and I don't know the history of Snowflake. I don't know if, how much they were influenced, if at all, by BigQuery design, but I feel like um, Snowflake has brought that kind of, uh, you know, decoupling and very scalable data architecture to really any cloud. I mean, they're, it's basically cloud independent with with them. So yeah, it's interesting that the kind of two different ways we've kind of evolved to get where we are in the cloud right now, cloud data warehousing. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> cool. So, so while you were uh, talking about ML and AI, this question came to my mind, uh, like 
around data scientists. So when a data scientist is working, and and this is like a bridge between uh, agile and and the data si science world, mm -hmm. where if, if a data scientist is working on one piece of a uh, story, on building a data model, right? I had an argument with one of the data scientists once um, for one of the sprints saying, okay, I need an estimate on this story that you are working. And the data scientist came and told me that I'm working on a model. I can't tell you whether I can do it in one day or one week, how long it takes. So, so if I'm asking for an estimate for a data scientist on working on who's developing a model, uh, mm -hmm. how can this agile and data scientists work hand in hand? Boy, that's an interesting question. And it's so true. Like, it's so like right on because data science in a lot of ways is such an art. Um, when we we build software, like, you know, we've, we, and we do software very collaboratively. Um, you know, people will build different components. I have found um, data science can be much more isolating. Like an individual can do a lot of work on a model by themselves, you know, especially once the data engineering is done and it's just a matter, I'm going to go grab my data and it's working on, on a model. And I think one of the issues, one of the challenges is with data science, you are in a lot of ways, I mean, it, it's called data science for a reason. Like you're literally doing experiments, like you formulate hypotheses, you have data, and then you're trying to do essentially the equivalent of an experiment. You're trying to analyze your data in certain ways and see if, if it holds up, if your assumptions hold up. And um, so, yeah, it, it's a little bit hard. It, it's a little bit of a, like a, a different culture. And, and I used to work in science I, for about 10 years. I worked in life sciences and it, it was very interesting. And, and the way data scientists work is a lot like the way life scientists who work like in wet labs work. You know, they're, you know, don't ask me when I'm going to come up with a brilliant breakthrough. Um, and so, yeah, it's a hard question of how, and, I, and it was interesting because I worked on more of the computational biology side. So I was more like the software side and having to, to you know, kind of address kind of the question you just asked him when it's like, <laughs> It, it, it's. I think part of it is we both both sides need to understand that we're we're coming at the same kind of problem, but from different angles, and we're building like different parts of the puzzle, and we just want to make the puzzle pieces fit together. And figuring out how to do that is a little bit hard. I think I think data scientists are more adept or or able to like pick up like agile practices and maybe start doing things like doing smaller experiments so rather than you know I i'm going to build the final model get the optimal model in a month i'm going to build you know i'm going to work with a subset of the data you know do some validation testings um, so i think data science can definitely be agile um, and i think it's as somebody who worked in waterfall methodology early in my career, it's like, you know, coming, switching to agile is really different because, and, and, but it can be done. Right. I mean, and, and then you realize it's like, Oh, this is a great way to do it. So I think some of it may be learning by collaboration, like data scientists who maybe have more of a, like a, a monolithic approach, like a waterfall like approach to, to doing data science might see some benefits to agile and and vice you know and vice versa i mean you know we as data engineers can can maybe pick up some some good practices from data scientists that aren't necessarily in our in our agile kind of toolbox so i right. think somehow, yeah i think learning from each other and being patient, <laughs> being patient. <laughs> yep, yep got it so basically have in the initial sprint maybe pick up and try to implement uh, like a coarse grain solution of model and then in consequence sprint maybe further refine your model. Yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. Like you may not, if you're working with a new data set and you have like some hypothesis about a certain thing, you might start with, well, first I'll validate some of my simple assumptions, maybe do like clustering, do, do some k-means clustering on the data just to see, I'm assuming it has a certain breakdown or a certain distribution, you know, is that the case? Yes. Okay. Then now I'll do something else. Maybe dig into one of those kind of categories and and do some work with that data. And so it again, it's kind of like with Agile. You, you can have an idea of where you're going, like overarching. I'm going to build this service, and it's going to be a bunch of microservices. Well, maybe in data science, it's like a bunch of micro experiments that collectively, you know, build up to 
like larger and larger, uh, enable larger and larger experiments. Um, and so maybe there are some techniques there like that. I mean, this is very idealized. And I know from working like on the data science side, I mean, you have a bunch of data and you're really excited and you want to work with it. And, yeah. and it's very easy to be heads down. Um, and depending on the culture, like in academia, it's very easy to like go into your office, close your door and people won't bother you because they're all doing their thing too. And so, um, but in the business world where you have deadlines, you need to deliver software. I think it's a different, it's a different kind of mindset. And um, I think with ML building models, as, as we get in more and adopt ML ops, and we realize there's different ways to, to build services, we can you know, write software the way we've traditionally done, or we can build ML models, which you know, is also software. It's basically, it's a service. It still runs in a container on a cluster and all that. And you make you know, it, it REST API calls to it and you get some really cool answer back. <laughs> so, how, so I think ML is gonna be driven more and more by agile practices and and data science is still more on the more like data analysis where you might have somebody doing ad hoc queries. It's that more exploratory thing. So I think there's always going to be this tension between the more science analysis side and the engineering side where we know what we want to build. Right, right. Sure. So that will be a challenging uh, thing for a scrum master <laughs> to handle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and also if you look at the output of uh, a machine learning uh, work, right? It's a model mm -hmm. and it's a single model which probably is representative of the entire project as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's where the challenge is as well. It's not like probably if I'm developing 10 different features, like, uh, okay, again, features, I'm talking about business functionality, not the machine learning features. Yeah. But let's mm -hmm. say, uh, like if I'm developing an application, I can probably easily break it down into like features. Like I would want, I'm doing this on this specific layer, but I think breaking that down in a machine learning project is much more challenging. I think that's where the biggest challenge lies because breaking down a machine learning problem is not easy because there's just one output at the end, which is a model. Yeah, right, right, exactly. And, and you're right about like figuring out all the features and, oh, and going back to, I think one of the questions earlier about like, what are the new tools? I think one of the really interesting tools from an ML perspective is like feature stores. So these databases that are basically designed so that we're not redoing the feature engineering and build and data transformation to get features where we can actually, we, we can go to a repository where all that work has been done and we're gonna save it and we're gonna reuse it. I think that's also gonna help. And, and tools like that, you know, that idea, oh, we're gonna share our features, that helps to impose like common values, common practices. And so that's another way Agile might like get into the data science, a little more in the data science practice. Um, because we're, you know, as soon as you start sharing something, you've got community agreements and common practices and things like that. So, yeah, no, absolutely love that. Love that. Uh, I think we, the more the different teams work closer, I think it's always good for data science. Yeah, it is. It is funny because I, I was thinking about this the other day because we're we're doing a lot of hiring um, at Four Mile Analytics, and I, and it occurred to me like. I think a lot of people feel like imposter syndrome, like they don't know as much as they should know. And it's like, definitely, I mean, I feel that way. I definitely don't know as much as I feel like I should know. And it's like, and I realize it's like, one of the things we do is like, we hire people based on what they know, how well they learn, because even if they know stuff now, a year from now, we're going to be working with new tools. And then how well they collaborate, because it's like, no, no one of us is going to you know, do something, or very few of us, I'm not going to do anything really innovative on my own. But if I work with a team of people, chances are, you know, I'm going to do some interesting stuff. So I feel like, yeah, this, I being able to work in groups and being able to learn, you know, that's, those are like key pillars to being good at data engineering or data science or ML, as well as all the knowledge stuff, you know, that, yeah, I really think you have to have all three of those pillars. So. Absolutely. And seeing the evolution in containers, container orchestration, cloud, machine learning, data engineering in the last five to 10 years, I would say 10 years down the line, we would be in a completely different world altogether. Right. And therefore, learning is the most important part for like being able to adapt uh, to new technology and also variety of uh, mindsets in the team. I think those two are yeah. the most important aspects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Totally. I totally agree with you, Ranga. I, the, 
the mindset is so important. Um, yeah, because it's just like, even if you, you know, if you're working on a project, it's like you might have to like divide and conquer. Like someone will go learn the ETL tool. Someone will go learn the, you know, the data storage system and somebody will go learn the, the visualization, you know, platform kind of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I'd love to know it all and there's just no way. I mean, I've Absolutely. barely scratched the surface of all the stuff that's out there that, you know, that we collectively all work with, you know, every day. So, yeah, I think definitely the mindset, just just understanding you're constantly learning and you're working with other people and, you know, you're never going to know it all. You know? yeah. It's just it's impo uh, just impossible. Uh, Absolutely. So in terms of what next to expect uh, for the ML and AI world. So now we see that there are a lot of pre built tools on the ML and AI where any startup can straight away. Uh, have throw that data to the predefined model and then see the analysis. So where do you see uh, uh, this ML and AI world going from here in the next five years or so? I think probably the biggest challenge is going to be, again, sort of maturation around processes and analyzing the models, understanding the models. So what we're really good at now is building the models. Like we we're good at really good at generating data, collecting data, processing, doing the data engineering and then landing it. And now we have these really great tools for building models. And it's like, you know, we have really fast cars and we're all going to jump in the car and we're going to start driving, but we haven't really driven a lot. So we're not very experienced. So some of us are going to crash. And so what happens is it's like, when the language models get built, the very large ones, you know, they, you know, use, you know, whatever natural language text is available. And so a lot of that is stuff that we find on the Internet. And if you can imagine, like, teaching a child, like, educating a child by telling them to go read every, anything they can find on the Internet, I mean, they're going to, you know, find things that are just nightmarish, horrific, and they're going to find really great things. And it's like when we build models, it's not just a matter of, piping the data in, cranking the algorithm and getting something spit out because we already know there's, we, we deal with issues in bias and unfairness. And we, I think we're going to need to develop better tools um, like around explainable AI. Like, why did you make this decision? Why, why did I not get that loan or why did I not get accepted or why did I not get hired? Um, we collectively need to be able to like tell people it's like well okay th th these are the factors that we took into account and then we also have to be able to look at it just from a social perspective it's like do we want those factors to be consideration about whether somebody gets a loan or gets a job so i think the hardest problems are going to be around catching bias and ensuring fairness and just understanding just because we can build a model and like it doesn't crash, the model doesn't crash, the algorithms don't break, it spits out something that we can put into a container and we can run reliably. That doesn't mean what it's outputting is valuable. And so how do we assess the value of that? And I think I think that's probably the biggest challenge. And I think we're gonna see some of the, the most interesting work in sort of how you adapt AI and ML in an organization will be in, in that area and kind of compliant, you know, whatever kind of compliance issues come up in response to, you know, if there are like big incidents or like, you know, well-known um, uh, or like, um, well, yeah, well-acknowledged in the press instances where there's clearly like a mistake in AI um, or, you know, blatant unfairness somewhere or discrimination in an AI model, that'll just even further drive the, the, the need to address this in like the broader public uh, and not just within, you know, our our sort of narrow discipline. So I think Absolutely. that's the most interesting Absolutely. stuff as well. I think explainable AI and also responsible AI. I think yeah. those are the two most uh, biggest challenges that we have, <laughs> I guess. I mean, because for AI, uh, yeah, I think when you don't know why a certain decision is made, and you don't know if there is any bias in that specific decision. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And making sure that uh, there is uh, acknowledgement of the fact that uh, data is the most important part. And the fact that some of the older data might have bias built into them. Yes. Uh, 
So how do you how do you solve those kind of things? Those are some of the most interest most interesting challenges, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think they are, and it's like you know we, it, yeah, it's like we a lot of these things we hadn't really thought of, at least you know within the like the ML community or like when we when we think about algorithms and things like that, it's like you know we didn't realize the problem that was lurking just over the horizon. Um, and now it's it's become much more apparent, and and it's like yeah. So what what's the next layer of problem that we're not anticipating? Um, yeah, I remember like when when people started working with um, the deep learning networks, and you know, like again, like 15 years ago, things were getting really exciting, and there were some concerns. Like, how do you know why it? came up with this answer. Well, it just because, you know, we did this big matrix multiplication and tensor math and it spit out this, you know, set of vectors or whatever. And that's that's where we got it. And and now it's like and, and that and that is prior, like older techniques where it was very symbolic and you had like decision trees and you can look at a path through a decision tree. So it was much easier to explain. So now the idea is, well, how do you explain, you know, why you categorize something as a cat versus a dog. And it's like, well, cause I saw a bunch of things that look like that one and you have to. And so the explanation part of it is, well, this is what I learned from and it. And it goes back to the data. So it's like, there's this whole, I imagine we'll have like a bunch of techniques and disciplines for analyzing how, mo how neural nets learn and how they change over time and how different pieces of data or data with different characteristics alter the network one way or another. Um, so it's almost like a, like an archaeology kind of digging into the, like the wiring of the networks and why why it behaves the way it does. It's almost like, yeah, like an analyzing the behavior of the network and during training is is like a whole area that's you know going to be probably a ripe area for research. So right, training is another important aspect that you I think touched upon. Uh, so for training any model uh, like the what are the various parameters that depends on on training like is it the share uh, amount of data that you have or the number of moving pieces like parameters that you have in making decision yeah there's definitely yeah that is um really like a yeah that's like a foundational problem is like the there's the number of attributes you have your features that you have and you know there's the amount of data and with the amount of data can be a little tricky sometimes because if you don't have enough data then you underfit it's like if you see a, a sequence like zero two four you can think oh well i'm just adding two or is it two to the n and you know it's not six is not the next number it's eight it's like well you you need more data to be able to figure out what the function is um and with learning a lot of times you know you're trying to basically approximate some function you know like when you're in classification or doing a classification and and so a lot of it will depend on the amount of data you have and you want you want enough data so that you're not you know um uh it's not you know underperforming or, or underfitting um but at the same time you don't want too much data um so that you overfit so that you build a model like a function that fits the training data exactly. And there are ways to deal with that. So there are techniques called like regularization where you can kind of uh, like penalize if you have like an outlier or maybe, you know, your models, your parameters are getting out of whack. You can kind of try and pull them back, you know, to, to something that feels a little more stable. Um, so there are ways of dealing with like um, overfitting and underfitting. Um, and there's the whole art of feature engineering, which is the idea around, you have a particular data set and there might be some um, inherent properties of whatever the domain you're studying that yep. aren't explicit enough in the data. So you have to like call it out, like a, like a relationship between two variables and it, you know, you don't have enough data or whatever, the algorithm's not tapping into that. So you explicitly call out that relationship and you keep adding more and more features like that. Um, that can help. Um, there's also the problem with hype, with hyperparameter tuning. So there are the features that we work with that, that are in our data. Yeah. Like you know, if you're predicting house prices in selling them, there's a bunch of features about the house. And then there are the hyperparameters. Like in a neural net, it's like, well, how wide is your network, and how many layers do you have, and what's your learning rate? That's completely independent of the housing market. So those hyperparameters. Um, 
they used you know we used to tweak them by hand but now there's techniques to, to to automate that so that's that's helpful and that's why like auto ml is is you know so successful now is because yeah. things like the hyperparameter tuning you you can figure out what's a good algorithm and then you can tune the hyperparameters and get pretty good results um so those are all factors so i think um and going into the 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 further question like <clears throat> once you kind of get a you feel like you've got a good fit to your model and yeah. your your t um test data and validation data you know when you try the model on that it, it works well then you have to think about it from an application perspective. It's like, well, okay, now I'm making decisions about who gets a loan or who doesn't get a loan. And then it's a really hard problem. And it's like, okay, how are you performing with respect to, say, the way the compliance officer in your bank thinks the you know, decisions should be made? And so I think I, I don't know what's ahead with regards to like tools for that. And it, I think it might be very domain specific how we start mm -hmm. kind of doing that like a business or almost like semantic kind of level of validation from a, from an organizational perspective. Right. Yeah. So just want to understand from your point of view, like what is the ultimate pinnacle in, from your point of view, like in terms of data and ML, AI and ML basically like, so this is my ultimate pinnacle. And uh, once AI and ML is able to achieve that and that's it, I don't know, man. It's been a really interesting year, especially at DeepMind, uh, which is a company that's owned by Alphabet, Google's parent company. And they have just been rolling out just amazing things. They followed like two really hard problems in the last year. They um, solved this problem in life science called uh, protein folding. So it's, it's going back, wait, 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 Ron, what you were talking about earlier about the sequences and like language. Well, um, if you have like, um, a protein, a sequence, it's kind of like DNA. There's like letters that represent the molecules. And with proteins, you have this series of like um, amino acids and there's like 20 of them. So you've got an alphabet of 20 um, characters. And then you have these strings that can be, you know, very small tens of amino acids or thousands. And when a cell makes a protein, they start, you know, they, uh, start cranking out these strings of amino acids and they start taking these shapes. And um, it's been very hard to figure out what's that, like predict the shape, look at the sequence, what's that shape gonna look like? And so for years now, there, there have been like AI competitions um, for what's called a protein folding problem. And, and basically like protein experts would go out and they would do x-ray crystallography and figure out what's the shape of a protein. And then they take the sequence and give that to a bunch of computer scientists who would make predictions. And then they check the two. And it was always like, you know, maybe 50% right. And that, you know, we'd all be like, oh, this is awesome. And uh, we'd never quite feel like it was getting there. And just within like the last year, DeepMind came up with a program called AlphaFold um, which is built on, you know, it, it builds on DeepMind technology plus uses something called Rosetta, which is a big computational biology platform. And between those two things, they were able to get basically like near experiment quality for, for this protein folding problem, which is like a huge problem in life science. So if you want to do things like drug discovery, you have to understand how proteins are shaped so you can understand how they fit together. So now all of a sudden, they have unlocked like this huge thing. We can do much more in computational biology than we could have done even like two years ago. So that's a huge thing. They've also recently announced um, a program called Alpha Code, which can take like specifications and start writing software code. So I feel like um, we're already farther along than I really expected, like in terms of solving really hard problems. So, I, and I also think two worlds. There's like the stuff that we I do every day that feels very kind of pragmatic in a business world. And then there's like the stuff that's coming out of deep mind, which is like so far on the bleeding edge. It's like, I'm not quite, I can't even see what the next thing is. It's like, they they are just kind of rolling it out there. They're, whatever the technology is, they are applying it to everything from, yeah, like protein life sciences to software engineering. And so I think we're going to continue doing data stuff and getting the figure out the data mechanics and how do we manage it. 
And then folks over at DeepMind are, are like cracking really hard problems. And uh, yeah, it's hard to see. It's like, it's so bright over there, you know, in terms of the possibilities, I'm not quite sure what's coming next. Right, right. So based on what you said, I think we are just kind of getting started with the real AI and ML world. And for mm -hmm. anybody starting the journey um, into ML and AI, I think they shouldn't be worried about their career if they hit, if they start oh, off with ML and AI, right? So yeah, they have a long way to go. It's not like when we started our career, it was like what C, C++ and then uh, yeah. Java and like keeps changing. But in ML and AI, it's going to be there to be a lifetime probably. Yeah, for sure. I, I think so. I think it'll be interesting to see. I mean, a lot of us, you know, code programs. I mean, at what point will, will we be more data driven and less putting in explicit instructions into an IDE to tell the machine what to do? Um, yeah, I don't know. There, somewhere there's an inflection point where yeah. <laughs> I don't know where that is. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that would be a a wonderful thing to think about. What's the point when we would start having more ML models than programs that we write? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that would be cool. Because then you get to think about problems, like the specific problems. It's like how to design a drug to solve a particular problem. You know, you Absolutely. put your yeah. It's like the 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 specific problems you solve will be different, but the challenges. You know, they're new challenges. But you know, you, you use your creativity, your analytic skills. You know your synthetic thinking, that all that you those will 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 keep doing those forever. Going that, so yeah, lots of I think there's a lot of exciting stuff ahead. You know, yep. probably more exciting than what we saw in the last thirty years. It's just going to just keep oh. getting more and more interesting. Absolutely, I yeah. think cloud has kind of just uh, taken the whole game to a different level altogether. It has, yep. And it's going to be really interesting. You know, the, the advances in the engineering around quantum computing are super interesting. And, the, you know, the, the number of you know, like qubits that are involved are just keep getting bigger and bigger. And it's like at some point that will also be a factor. And it's like how what new algorithms will be coming up that are designed for quantum computing instead of, um, you know, von Neumann machines and the stuff we use. And you know, what, what are, what's going to be enabled? Like, you know, what, what's going to be like the deep learning network, but the quantum ver computing version and you know, what, yeah. what will that kind of unleash? So, yeah. so yeah, great time to be working in data and computer science and, you know, any, any related area. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so now let's talk about cloud a little bit and what is, uh, what role cloud has played. So infrastructure, now has helped uh, in um, kind of being able to run uh, our AI and ML models. So first we had like VMs and kind of physical uh, machines. Now we have Kubernetes and now we have serverless. So, so how does that evalu evolution uh, help uh, in cloud with the AI and ML model? And what next after this in terms of cloud infrastructure which uh, will be focused only uh, on AI and ML? Well, I think a big factor that's going to help is, I think you mentioned serverless. And, um, you know, again, you know, this may be just like my jaded experience. It's like, I'm so glad I don't want, I, you know, the idea of never having to deal with a server again makes me so happy. You know, and I, this is as someone who's, you know, run, you know, right, you might not Absolutely. you know, RJ45 cables to run networks and dealing with like physical, like, you know, routers in the wall and, you know, installing Linux off disks. And it's just like, all that stuff is just, it feels like overhead. Like, you know, you just have to plow through it so that you could go install your software, write, write your code and run your software. And now all of a sudden it's like, I, I don't need to think about that. Like, I love like, um, like on cloud, like with um, even something like um, Cloud Firestore, um, you know, in the past, I would have had to set up like a MongoDB to store some data. It's not very structured, so I can't use relational. So I'll have to set up MongoDB. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. I can run my ML models, you know, use, you know, data that's stored in maybe JSON structures or some other semi-structured kind of format. And I, I don't have to like build from scratch. You know, it's kind of like, um, 
my dream is, you know, I want this buffet that's made by this, you know, brilliant world chef and I just want it all laid out. And in reality, it's like, uh, you know, I've got a bunch, I'm in a supermarket and I have to go buy my own food and make it myself. And it's like, it's like getting closer and closer to having that thing where it's all laid out for you. And I feel like the, the trend for with like serverless and cloud, it's, um, and and tool supporting tools like Dataplex, all this infrastructure will make it easier to find what we need, kind of build experiments quickly, like prototype things quickly, and kind of test out ideas faster. So I think the companies and groups that kind of figure out how to how to exploit serverless and use things like Vertex AI and notebooks in the cloud. Um, you know, and like plug in, you know, to GPUs when you need them and not when you don't. And people who figure out how to use the technology and then adopt like the agile practices, they're the ones that are going to be the most innovative. And, and I think the cloud is just kind of making that possible. And I've, I've found from my experience working in different clouds, there's no question that it's easier to do in Google than it is in any of the other clouds I've, I've worked in. So I think, you know, Google's often said it's like, you know, they're like number three of the big three with AWS and Microsoft Azure. Um, and that may still continue to be the case, but I feel like in terms of data engineering and AI ML, they're definitely going to be leading, like, at least in the technology, if not in the, you know, adoption and just use numbers. Absolutely. And it goes uh, with that ethos as well, right? So they believe all companies are like data companies, right? And data is their first data first strategy. So it goes with that ethos as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I have the same view as well. So oh. Google definitely. I love Google. And yeah, Google will be number one in data in terms of cloud. Yeah. We don't care about VMs and all. No. <laughs> That's underneath. It's like, you know, how far down the stack do we have to think about it, right? We don't, we don't think about transistors and, you know, the quantum physics going on, exactly. the states change states and things like that. And it's, yeah. you know, so why, you know, why do we have to think about VMs? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So now I would like to now um, get some input from you to help our learners who are watching this now um, in terms of books uh, that they should follow or uh, kind of read and go through for data engineering and AI. Like from beginner to the advanced ones. Yeah. So, Dan, like if somebody is starting their uh, data engineering or machine learning journey today, like yeah. what would your advice be like? So where, where do you want them to start? I would say, let's see, you're starting data engineering. Well, I would say learn Python, learn to work with Python. Um, I would say learn to work with files. Um, data files like CSV files are great to work with. Um, I would say um, if you want to get some data to work with, there's lots of places to get data. Um, I forget, is it UC Irvine? Uh, there's the, the machine learning repository out of the University of California has a bunch of data sets. If you just, and if you just Google, you know, machine learning yeah. data sets, uh, I think it's UCI. Kaggle. Google yeah, Kaggle. Kaggle. Kaggle's a great place. Um, if you want to work with really large data sets, um, Google has public data sets available in BigQuery. AWS has a bunch. There are, um, oh gosh, I forgot. There is a data repository. I can't think of the name of it. It's just, just basically almost like a GitHub for data um, that's okay. available. And then like, you know, different um, agencies, uh, government agencies, I know US, EU, uh, UN have data repositories for for large data sets. So you can always find some data sets to play with in whatever your area of interest is. Um, but definitely I would say work with SQL. I would say, work, excuse me, work with Python. I would say learn a little bit about relational databases um, and SQL, just learn enough to just query languages, just get a basic understanding of what a normalized data model is. Um, and then, but also be aware that, you know, normalization works really well with things like transaction processing systems. So if you're like buying a book at Amazon, there, there's an OLTP system there. Analyzing data in, in very large amounts, we design databases differently and we don't 
so much care about normalizing. In fact, we like to denormalize, gives better performance. So I would start to just kind of step your toe into things like, just look at like Cassandra or Bigtable just to understand different ways um, that data might be stored. I'd say those were big things. For Also for data engineering, there are different focus areas. So definitely there's like the kind of ETL-like focus where, where it's all about moving the data, transforming the data. And so Python's great for that. Um, Python and SQL are both great for that. Um, if you're interested in like figuring out how to structure the data in the database, like if you want to design the tables in BigQuery or Postgres, then I would say definitely want to take a look at data modeling. And gosh, I'm trying to think, because again, data modeling for OLTP is different for data warehouse, data warehousing. Um, Ralph Kimball wrote a book years ago, it was probably about 20 years ago on data modeling for data warehousing, which again, worked really well in the Oracle days when we were on-prem. It's called dimensional modeling. That's still around and it's still useful for small data marts. That's not necessarily the way you'd want to design something in BigQuery. Um, I think one of the best places to go, honestly, is uh, the Google documentation. If you want to say, learn about modern data warehousing, I would look there. Um, there are, and definitely like videos. I know Renga's got a bunch of courses. Um, look, look for courses like on Udemy, LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, um, all really good sources. And in fact, Google, a lot of the Google trainers will do courses and they will go up on Coursera. So you can get a very Google oriented perspective right. from Coursera as well as, as other folks. Um, yeah, I would definitely say those are probably the places I would start. Um, and yeah, and if you're coming from software engineering, you want to learn data engineering, you probably have a good handle on DevOps practices, GitOps kind of thing. So that that's definitely something you can leverage here as well. Cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, any courses that you have that you would like to recommend to our viewers to get started with? I, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy. And uh, I can, I'm sorry, I don't have links now. I'd be happy to share links with you later. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got the, on Udemy, I have a course for the associate cloud engineer and the data engineer exam. Um, if you're new to Google Cloud, it might help to just get a, a view overview doing with cloud engineer at sort of the associate level. So maybe, you know, if you are just starting out, um, the data engineer course covers um, a lot of the sort of data architecture, data engineering, ETL, plus the ML pieces um, as well. The, the cloud architect probably is not as useful for so if you're really focused on data engineering if you want like a broad view there's that course as well um on linkedin i've got a bunch of courses on sql for data scientists um, both kind of like intermediate advanced query tuning and i'll be happy to share some links to those as well yeah. uh, you know, get, get access so to those learn, so then uh, uh, sorry i mean uh, go ahead okay, thank you uh so for a learner, I think we, we are saying two different things here. So one is the data side of things and one is the cloud side of things, right? So if I want to get started, should I get started with like Python and then go with SQL and data and then go into cloud or uh, go into cloud first to understand the overall infrastructure and then go into data and MLOps? Uh, well, you could do it either way. And um, you, you could start, for example, you know, if you have your laptop, you can definitely, you know, you probably have enough disk space to store some good amount of data. So you could work with like Python and Pandas is a package that um, is used a lot in data science. Uh, Scikit-learn is a great one for machine learning. So I would say you could work there or you could get started in Google Cloud. Google has a free tier. So you can spin up like a small VM and you could get into Linux there and you can, you know, install Python and the Python packages and actually work in the Google Cloud and use like cloud storage to store your files in the object system. And you can learn about using like GSUtil for copying data over, put it into your, um, your VM and then use Python to do some interesting work with the VM. Maybe use scikit-learn 
to um, build a classification model. Like there's a, <clears throat> a data set, um, it's called the iris data set. It's about these flowers, four different kinds of iris flowers. And um, it's a relatively simple model. It's got like four attributes and you can, it's a great one to learn about classification. It's the data is in a CSV file. So it's really great for just learning the mechanics of working with files. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd say if you want to start with cloud, that's great. Um, sign up for Google, get the $300 in free credits. And if you run out of that, there's always the free tier. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely start a, just get a, an Ubuntu mm -hmm. VM started in Google Cloud. And uh, yeah, I think that that's a great way to do it. Then you're kind of doing both at the same time. So, And also, I want to add a little bit on dance books. We touched upon dance courses, but I, I loved dance books on like both the, I think there are three books that you wrote, Dan, like for all the three uh, Google Cloud certifications, Cloud Engineer, uh, Architect, and uh, the data engineer one, engineer. I yeah. like, absolutely loved uh, the architect one. Uh, oh, like, great. It oh, was great. like one of the best books. Uh, like I've read a lot of certification books and I feel like for somebody who's really good at architecture, I felt your book on architecture was kind of uh, the best way to get familiar with how to do things in Google Cloud. Oh, if thank you. you. I, I yeah, it, it was like perfect summary. I mean, like I don't... I, I, like a lot of times certification books are tuned towards an exam and not really mm -hmm. architecture in general, I would say. But this one was mm -hmm. very well written in that sense because it was not really trying to like sell, I mean, tell you about the exam, but it really gave you the skills to make choices on Google Cloud. And oh, it was a wonderful book for me. Oh, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that, especially, you know, coming from someone of your caliber and experience. I, I appreciate that. I will say the uh, second edition is coming out soon. I, I, I think wow. I can announce that now. It's it's all written. It's, it's probably in a week or two it will be announced. And then the Cloud Engineer uh, next edition is is next up for the for the new version. So, uh yeah, thank you for for mentioning that. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I, so I really loved it, and I'm looking forward to the next version of the book as well. Then, <laughs> great, thank you. Yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully it's useful. That's that's the goal. I hope it just you know helps people pass the exam, and you know, and and maybe a little bit more. I, I, yeah, I appreciate the the mention about you know beyond just passing the exam because yeah, arch architecture especially and data engineering too. It's, you know, the exam covers so much, but then you get into the, your job and you're working on it. And then it's just like, oh, you exactly. got to know this much. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good. I think with that, um, you would probably conclude our today's session. Uh, I know it's getting really late for you, Dan. And I really appreciate you taking time so late in your evening and uh, oh. sharing your thoughts on uh, ML and data engineering. Um, and thank you very much, Ranga, uh, with that uh, final thoughts, Dan, from you. Yeah, thank you. No, I just want to say thank you again. I think this is such a great topic, uh, super fascinating. And I'm just I'm really excited to see how many people are interested in this and how much like the interest has grown. And uh, I just I think it's fantastic that you are are doing, you know, doing these uh sessions and just helping people learn and it's just it's fantastic how much um just the opportunities you're giving people i really appreciate that so so thank you yeah and i hope you know maybe we can do this again some other time on another topic or something but yeah this was i really enjoyed i think uh, it's great to to get together like this sure, sure. thanks lord Dan, actually you. from the time i read the architect book uh, it was <laughs> kind of a desire of me to be able to talk to you. And I'm really, really happy th that it happened today. <laughs> uh, well, thank Thanks you. a lot thank for you. taking the time. And, and you know, and I, I know, and, and of course, and Ray, you have a lot of courses. I mean, a lot of the Google courses on Udemy, some of the best selling courses are yours. So I just want to say that's the other thing about the, uh, I just want to mention about Google. There is such a supportive community and really like a lot of cross fertilization and people just, you know, kind of everybody feels like it's looking out for everybody else and it's very supportive community. So if you're getting into a cloud and you're trying to decide, you know, you you won't be alone in Google Cloud. There are a lot of people out there that want to help you succeed. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, I would like to conclude today's session. Thank you all and hope you enjoyed watching this session with Dan Sullivan and Ranga Karnam. 
please do share your thoughts and comments below in this video till next session bye for now bye bye <laughs> do not forget to subscribe go ahead i'm waiting thank you keep learning every day keep learning in 28 minutes